Today, there's a lot of emphasis on a little verse from Romans 6, 14, B, which says, we're not under the law, but grace. And this little verse is being distorted to mean that sin is no longer sin. I mean, what is, what is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. Amen. So if we're not under the law, um, then sin is not really sin because we're not breaking the law. It's like, uh, have you ever been in a place where there's no speed limit? I like those kind of places. Uh, I don't even know if they still exist, but they used to. I remember driving uh, some stretches in Montana years ago and there was no speed limit. So if I could go 120 miles an hour, uh, I'm not breaking the law because there's no law. But these verses have been distorted to mean that you know sin is no longer sin because we're not under the law anymore. So the question that we have for today is, we hope to resolve today, is are we under the law or not. Well, let us first understand this. The Gentiles were never under the law to begin with. Now, in fact, this is what separated the Jew and the Gentile was the law. Um, you're over here, we're here. Come not nigh us because we're holier than you. Now, the Jews were under the law with its 613 regulations. How would you like to live in under a system like that? I've never taken the time to count those regulations, but they go something like this. Um, supposing I touch an unclean animal, the carcass of an unclean animal, dead animal, and that makes me unclean. And if somebody touches me, that makes them unclean. Those are the kind of regulations that were under the law. And according to most scholars, they have them numbered to about 613 different regulations. So this was the attitude of the Jew, come not nigh me, we're holier than thou, you're unclean, and we're clean. The Gentiles, on the other hand, were subject to the law of conscience and they were to be judged by the law of conscience. Uh, the Jews were subject to the law, they would be judged by the law. The Gentiles would be judged by the law of conscience. Now, Paul makes this very clear in the book of Romans. In fact, the Roman church was quite divided 50-50. 50% Gentile, 50% Jew. And one of the big problems in the early church was that you have these converted Jews, they have accepted Christ, but we're still trying to incorporate the law of Moses into their newfound faith. They had never really severed from the Old Testament law. <clears throat> I mean, it's easy to see this in Peter. Um, Peter is not clear on the Gentile connection. He's not clear whether he should be sitting and eating with Gentiles because he was still of the law mentality. Uh, you see him struggling with the dietary laws of the Old Testament when the Lord is telling him to rise, kill, and eat. And he's telling the Lord, I've never eaten anything that's common or unclean. And so he's struggling with dietary laws that were all passe. They had all ceased at the cross. Now, Paul later in the book of Romans compares the death of a spouse to a covenant that is defunct. In Romans chapter 7, the covenant is over and you're free to be married to another with not feeling any guilt. Um, 
You're freed from the covenant, the law of Moses, and now you can be joined to another covenant. Uh, the former commitments are severed. You don't have to suffer any guilt, um, but you can be fully embraced or embrace the new covenant of Christ. So looking at Romans 7 for a minute, Paul is comparing a marriage that is severed by death to a covenant that has now um, been nailed to the cross. It's passé. In Romans 7, 1, he says, uh, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them <coughs> that know the law. Who's he speaking to? The Jews, right? How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, although she be married to another man. I'm dropping down to verse 6. But now are we delivered from the law that being dead were and we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of letter. Do you see what Paul is saying here? That he is comparing the death of a spouse to the death of a, a covenant. This covenant is dead. It's over. It's passe. It was nailed to the cross. And now you're free to be fully embrace the new covenant. Are you with me here? But do you see a problem here? You see the converted Jew trying to live under both covenants. He's trying to live under the old covenant and the new covenant. And to compound the situation, you have believing Jews who are trying to impose the law of Moses on the Gentile converts. Um, and looking at Acts 15, if you'd like to turn there, Acts 15, they were saying you can't be saved unless you be circumcised, unless you keep the law of Moses. Now, these were believing Jews. They accepted Christ. But you see, they have never severed from the old covenant. And so they're trying to impose the law of Moses on the Gentile converts. In Acts 15 and verse 1, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised, after the manner of Moses ye cannot be saved. Uh, and also in verse 5, same chapter, And there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So not only had many of these Jewish converts um, not severed from the law, but many of them were trying to impose the law of Moses with its 613 regulations upon the Gentile converts as well. You see the problem? You see Paul's emphasis about not being under the law. And this later sect of the Pharisees later became known as the Judaizers, right? And these Judaizers had almost crippled the church in Galatia. They'd come down to Galatia and tried to impose the you know, the right of circumcision and the law of Moses upon the Gentile converts. And they just about stifled the work there in Galatia. So Paul is really dealing with an element here that uh, is really hurting the church. And his emphasis about not being under the law has nothing to do with keeping the commandments of Christ. Are you with me here? 
He's talking about being severed from the Old Testament law with its 613 regulations. How would you like to be judged by that kind of a setup where there's 613 regulations where you can hardly breathe without breaking some kind of, some form of the law? So these um, Judaizers not only were crippling the church in Galatia, but these are the false apostles that Paul alludes to in 2 Corinthians that were coming down and trying to do the same thing there. The Jewish believers had a very difficult time trying to separate from the law of Moses, and that's why Paul's emphasis on we're not under the law had a, a real punch to these people here. Uh, you know, many Christians today are picking up this line and saying we're not under the Ten Commandments and so on. In fact, I had a minister sit right in my office one day and he was telling me that, that we're not under the Ten Commandments. We have to keep the Ten Commandments. I said, well, which one do you have a problem with? He couldn't answer me on that, but... Uh, But this little line, we're not under the law, was uniquely directed to the Jews who were still attached to the law of Moses. <clears throat> now here's another scenario. Paul comes to Jerusalem. We're looking into Acts 21 now. Acts 21 and verse 19 through 21. And verse 19, Acts 21, 19. This is Paul. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous for the law. Many thousands who believe, but they're still zealous for the law. What law are they zealous for? The law of Moses, correct? Verse 21, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that thou ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs, the customs. Well, this is exactly what Paul was emphasizing to these Christian Jews because they were trying to be married to two covenants at the same time. They were trying to live under the law of Moses and yet Christ had set them free from that law with all of its regulations. It was nailed to the cross and now there's grace to live under his commandments as we walk in the spirit. So do you see what Paul is addressing here? Many of these Gentiles believers were being seduced into believing that they needed to adhere to the law of Moses to be saved. Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses you cannot be saved. Now, I want us to notice how Paul differentiates between those who know the law and those who do not know the law. Those who know the law, the Jew. Those who do not know the law, the Gentile. So let's look at a few verses beginning in Romans 3.19. I want us to be clear on this because I tell you, there is, a, there is a heresy just sweeping through the church today on this very verse and is basically saying that we can't possibly sin anymore because we're not under the law. This is not what Paul is saying. <clears throat> Romans 3.19 now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Who's that? 
the Jews. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be guilty before God. Now, Paul brings out that the Gentiles are going to be judged by the law of conscience. Let's back up into Romans 2 for a minute. Romans 2, 12. And it says, for as many as have sinned without law, who would that be? The Gentiles, okay. Shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law, and that is the Jew, correct? We're talking about those who know the law and those who do not know the law, those who aren't under the law and those who are not. The Gentiles were never under the law, the Jews were. And so when the new covenant comes, when Christ comes, many of the Jews who converted to Christ were still trying to live under the Old Testament law. Okay? You can explain this, right? I mean, I'm telling you, you can't realize how rampant this heresy is in the world. The biggest churches in the world are just embracing this in the audience. You know, they have packed house. And basically that's what they're telling them, you know, that they can't possibly sin anymore. Let's look at another verse in 1 Corinthians 9, 20. <clears throat> and under the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law. Who's that? The Jew. That I might gain them that are under the law. Verse 21, to them that are without law as without law. Who's he talking to here? Gentiles. Being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law, the Gentiles. Paul wanted to gain the Jew and the Gentile, those who are under the law and those who were without law. <coughs> so the whole point of this little exercise is to interpret what Paul is really saying when he says we're not under the law but under grace. Paul was showing the Jewish believer and the seduced Gentiles that we're not saved by keeping the 613 regulations of the law, but we're saved by grace. This was Paul's main message to the Galatians. As we said, the Galatians were being seduced by these Judaizers, they were coming down saying you have to be circumcised to be saved. So let's look at a few verses in the book of Galatians as well. <clears throat> Galatians in chapter 5. And beginning in verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised... He's referring to religion because that was what separated you and Gentile was circumcision. Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to the whole law. If you want to live under the system of the old covenant, then you are in debt to fulfill all 613 of its regulations. <clears throat> Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are, who are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. If you want to live on under the system, um, old covenant, if you want to be justified by the works of the law, then you're going to be judged by the works of the law. And believe me, you're going to break those laws because they're impossible to keep every little detail of that law. All right. That law really was given in the beginning to keep them in check because they couldn't handle liberty. So they were putting under that law. It was kind of a judgment. I think Ezekiel brings it out very well. 
So if you want to live in under the law, then Christ shall not profit you. The new covenant shall not profit. The new covenant says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my ways and keep my judgments and you shall do them. If you want to reject that, you want to live in under the other system, <clears throat> then you're going to be judged by the other system. It's awful quiet in here today. I, am I making this clear? Uh, you could put down Ezekiel 36, um, 26 and 27. I'll just read 27. This is a promise of the new covenant. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgment and do them. I'll put my spirit within you. I'll cause you to do it. I don't want to reject that covenant. I mean, the other one was all human effort. And believe me, in human effort, you're going to fail. I'd rather have the spirit of God in me. And as we pointed out, all of these fine points of the law you can contaminate yourself unwittingly by just touching somebody because they touched something that was unclean. Uh, I don't know if I'd like to live under that kind of a system. So grace offers forgiveness without works. You don't have to earn your repentance. Grace offers forgiveness without works. Grace enables us to walk in the spirit and to fulfill the righteousness of Christ. Amen? So much of today's message of we're not under the law is promoting a message of lawlessness. No, we're not under the law of Moses. We're espoused to Christ. And if we love him, we will Keep his commandments. Amen? So this is what is disturbing to me. I mean, especially traveling and you see it. How that this thing is taking hold of people. Uh, many of them kind of get duped into it because they have no knowledge of the scriptures. But when I see people that have known the scriptures going in that direction, it makes me think that their tears and God is removing them. Um, but then too, I don't think a lot of this is clarified. And that's why I'm trying to make it very clear today. But their message is not being under the law. It's no matter what you do, God loves you. We haven't done anything wrong because sin is the transgression of the law and we're not under the law. There is no condemnation in Christ. It's a message of unconditional love that God loves you no matter what you do and no matter what you're, where you're at. And it's a message that will take people down. And that's why we have to emphasize what we're doing right now. So true grace enables us to imitate the master and his commandments are not grievous, are they? There's not one commandment of Christ that I, oh, I wish that wasn't there. No, I love every one of his commandments. They're all to save us. They're all to enable us to inherit glory. Every one of those commandments. First John 5, 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. If we love God, then his commandments don't hurt us one bit. Sin is the breaking of the commandments. Righteousness is the keeping of the commandments. It's not so difficult, is it? <clears throat> There's one notable characteristic about the, the secret Satan. The evil one is an anarchist. Do you know what an anarchist is? 
He is anti-law. Lawless. He's called the lawless one, actually. The lawless one. He's a lawbreaker from the beginning. He is the antithesis of everything that Christ is. He's the opposite, the direct opposite of everything. I had a whole great big long list of things, which I'm not going to go into here, but just contrasting the two, how that they're two extreme poles apart. Christ was a law keeper. He keeps his father's commandments. Satan is a lawbreaker from the very beginning. <clears throat> First John 3, 8. First John 3, 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. What is sin? Breaking of the commandments. He sinned right from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. <clears throat> Not only was he a lawbreaker from the beginning, but his first appearance in the Garden of Eden was to Adam and Eve, who were given one commandment, and what was his suggestion? You don't have to keep this commandment. He's a lawbreaker and the evil one and his minions are still promoting the same message. We're not under the law. We're under grace. You don't really have to keep the commandments. God loves you no matter what. You see, the first thing he tried to do was to get man to break the commandment, just as he did. Now, as we've said before, we're almost through here. I just wanted to give you a few cardinal points here about this question of we're not under the law. His ministers don't have to deny the deity of Christ. They don't have to deny the virgin birth or the resurrection or the atonement, the blood of Christ. They don't have to deny any of that, really. His false ministers only have to preach a message of tolerance and love. God tolerates. He puts up with all of your naughty little ways. All he has to do is make people feel comfortable about sin, that they're not doing anything wrong, that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Well, listen, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ except sin. Sin separates us. They tell us that his sacrifice was so great that he's forgiven you in advance <clears throat> and you never need to repent again. Those are lies that come right from the You're not under the law, but grace. Remember the Nicolaitans in Scripture, in the book of Revelation? Well, if you search them out historically, they had some very immoral practices. And whenever they were challenged on what they were doing, you know what their line was? We're not under law, but grace goes right back into the first century, doesn't it? And it goes right back to the beginning of time. We're not under the law. So the true interpretation of Romans 6.14 was uniquely to Jewish believers who were still attached to the old covenant and also to Gentiles that were being duped into uh, you know, accepting the old covenant as a means of salvation.
several more verses here. 1 John 2, 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. We do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. So the true worshiper worships in spirit and in truth. Uh, you know, just one more verse here. I don't have it in my notes, but in Revelation, last chapter, 22, in verse 14, it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and that they may enter in through the gates into the city. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Don't ever fall for this line. We're not under the law, yes. We know we're not under the law. We never were under the law. The Jews were under the law. We were never under the law. But we keep the commandments of Christ because we love him. And his grace enables us to walk in the spirit and to fulfill the greater righteousness. Righteousness.